Hi, Gloria. Thank you so much for meeting with me today. If you could just introduce yourself a little bit and tell us how many years you served as ED and from what time period. Sure. Hi, my name is Gloria Totten. I was the executive director of Maryland NARAL from April of 1993 to May of 1996. Fantastic. And could you tell us a little bit more about the political environment at the time? What kind of issues was um, NARAL really focusing on during your tenure? Sure, it was a really interesting time to come into the organization because in 1992, under Karen Strickler's leadership, the NARAL team, Maryland NARAL team, had passed a referendum uh, called Question 6, which effectively codified Roe versus Wade into state law. And so I came in um, you know, with that kind of foundation uh, underneath me and uh, tried to figure out what we could do from there. And so we naturally turned our attention towards fighting for Medicaid funding for abortions for low-income women. Uh, which quickly became part of a what was then a national trend of welfare reform legislation that Bill Clinton was spearheading at the federal level and uh, states all across the country were taking on bills and the governor of Maryland at the time, Governor Schaefer, uh, was really uh, motivated to pass a welfare reform bill. Uh, there were two big problems that Marilyn Nayral faced in that legislation. One was the lack of Medicaid funding for abortions for low-income women, married with a provision in the bill that was a family cap provision that would limit the number of women, a number of children that women receiving uh, public assistance benefits uh, could have and, and, and receive support for. And so we quickly got embroiled into that fight. I can safely say that it's the first time that I have ever lobbied hand in hand with Catholic charities who could, because they were also opposed to the family cap. Uh, so we had lots of interesting boundaries setting. We wouldn't meet in each other's offices and we uh, would only meet in Annapolis and, and lobby together for kind of the shock value of having legislators see us both showing up against the family cap provision of the bill while still maintaining all star, our stalwart support for Medicaid funding for abortions. So that was the big, uh, the big first thing that I got in in 1994, and we were uh, we did help successfully defeat that welfare reform bill in 1994, which was a big, uh, big win for low income women across the state. And then in 1995, the big trend across the states again was. Uh, states mirroring a national bill to ban so-called partial birth abortions. And so we got embroiled in that fight uh, at the same time. Um, and again, we were successful in helping to defeat that bill, uh, one of the first states to do so at the time when I think by 1995, I think there were probably maybe a dozen or 15, 17 states that were rapidly enacting those, those bans. And so we've been really lucky to have uh, strong support in Maryland and Maryland NARAL has always had an incredible team of staff to do the work. And so I think that played a lot in, into it. At the same time, I worked really hard to strengthen and streamline the uh, PAC. So we were getting much more politically active um, and, and um, get in, improving their screening process for the candidates that we were supporting in the state. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I'd really like to transition into what reproductive freedom personally means to you now. Um, and if that's a viewpoint that's maybe changed during your tenure, or if that's something that's kind of remained constant throughout your career. Well, my story is that I had never met a woman whose life wasn't defined by the reproductive choices that were available to her. Um, as a young adult entering college, I already had experience with, you know, my mother not being able to get contraceptive because her abusive husband wouldn't let her. And um, so I knew what Griswold versus Connecticut was and what the importance of that Supreme Court decision was on women's ability to at least attempt to control their uh, childbearing. Um, I had sisters who had un 
intended pregnancies. It's one of the reasons why I got involved volunteering at Planned Parenthood as a teen as a teenager was because I saw so many of my older siblings and their friends who were not utilizing birth control and not accessing the services that Planned Parenthood had to offer. Uh, we had open adoption and closed adoption in our family. Um, aunts, uncles, my grandmother had 13 children, I'm sure not by all by choice. Um, and so I really understood firsthand how important these issues were to defining women's lives. Um, and at that time, it was really a, cl a class-based perspective coming from a, a really low-income uh, background. As I got older, I realized that these decisions were equally essential for women of all classes, um, wealthy or poor or middle class or anything in between. And that hasn't changed. Um, I continued you know, to have abortion rights be part of the work that I've done for my entire career. I formed two national organizations uh, that uh, we, you know, we had abortion rights as the center of the of the of the primary issues that we would advocate on um, through the Public Leadership Institute, the organization that I work on now. We wrote a playbook for abortion rights that's been used by legislators and advocates in states all across the country, and we've driven proactive public policy campaigns to try to not just defend abortion rights, but to expand abortion rights and access for all women. So it's stayed with me. <laughs> no, I mean, that's incredible, Gloria. And it's really interesting just to hear about your work and your perspective, um, you know, working with NARAL and then also your career beyond NARAL. So it was a really, really interesting conversation. Um, thank you so much for sitting down with me and meeting with me today. Um, and again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thanks for doing this and happy anniversary. Yes. <laughs>